Psychology is the scientific study of the mind and behavior. Psychologists are actively involved in studying and understanding mental processes, brain functions, and behavior. It is a mixture of atheistic, evolutionary, and Marxist thought at its core, and it rejects a biblical worldview and the power of God unto salvation. At its core, it gives a misdiagnosis and the wrong prognosis and leaves people in the position of having no hope outside of themselves. Unless psychology, understanding the mind and behavior, is directed by the Bible and has as it, at its core biblical redemption by the power of God, then it is by nature antagonistic towards true healing and deliverance. As a minister of the gospel, it's important to understand how the mind of man works. But to divorce that from the Bible or try to amalgamate Freudian or Jungian atheistic psychology with biblical thought is a horrible error that at its core stagnates and removes people from the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Greetings, Bible believers and followers of the End Time Message. Welcome to another episode of the Jason DeMars Podcast, the place where we explore the incredible mysteries hidden within the pages of the Bible. I'm your host, Jason DeMars. It's time to get started on another journey into the heart of God's Word. If it's your desire to grow in revelation and see the message in the light of the Bible, you're in the right place. Today, brothers and sisters, we delve into the scripture guided by the extraordinary revelations that God chose to unveil through Brother William Marion Branham, a messenger with a unique calling to fulfill Malachi 4 and Revelation 10:7 and unlock the secrets of the end time message. Our purpose isn't to have another basic Bible study. We're going to dig deep and peel back the layers of prophecy, decoding the signs, and perhaps discovering how the Bible resonates within the very fabric of our present day and time. In this podcast, my purpose is to help you grow in your faith through solid Bible teaching through the lens of the message of Malachi 4. So grab your Bible, a cup of coffee, and let's get started. And remember that your feedback, testimonies, questions, and prayer requests are always welcome. Please send them on social media or at jasondemars.com. Before we go into today's episode, I want to share something with you. Head over to jasondemars.com where I'm giving away free books. These books have been ordered by believers around the world, and many testimonies have been given about the great blessing they have been. I also want you to know that by God's grace and provision, we are also covering the shipping costs, free books, and free shipping. My purpose is not to sell books, but to proclaim the message of the hour free of charge. I've written these books to build your faith, increase your spiritual revelation, and be a witness for God's message in the end time. Here's a list of a few of them. A summary of the revelation of the seven seals, the end time message handbook, the mystery of the Malachi for Elijah, holiness to the Lord, and foundations. Head over to jasondemars.com right now and claim your free books. With that said, let's get into today's podcast. Hey everyone, thank you so much for tuning into the podcast. Wonderful to have you here. Um, this topic, this time, is going to be about the destructive force of psychology. And this can sort of be like a, uh, just a dog whistle to some that people get up and preach against psychology and say certain types of preachers are preaching psychology. I think that's a great danger. It's not about a certain style. If you preach uh, uh, passionately, that's wonderful. If you preach, if you're a teacher, um, it's not de facto preaching psychology. Um, either way, at its core, you must be preaching the Word of God and not trying to uh, change people's minds using human means, but pointing them to the power of, of God. Now, let's look at some, some scriptures, and then let's start to talk about psychology. Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, 
that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So our minds do need to be changed, but our minds are, are we're tr they're transformed by them being renewed. So we once thought one way, we have to think a different way. This isn't mere, uh, this is, you can see in verse one, this is a surrender. That's, that's what we're doing is we have to surrender ourselves to God, lay aside all our thinking so that we can think his thoughts and our mind is renewed. So how do we not be, don't be conformed to the way the world does things? You know, again, psychology is a way the world does things. It's not the way God does it. It's not the way God moves and works. They might have some commonality with how God does it. But at its core, again, God is out of the picture in psychology. Our minds must be renewed. That is how we're transformed, right? That isn't psychology. That's the Word of God being preached, being read, being studied. And by the Holy Spirit, it's revealed to us. Uh, one way that Revelation is described is it goes from your mind See, you, you, it comes from your ears into your mind, into your memory. And then it's by revelation, it goes to our heart. And when it goes to our heart, it stays there. And when it goes to our heart, that's when transformation takes place. And when transformation takes place, that is when we can prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. It's not asking us to approve, to prove it through argument, but that we prove it by our lives. 2 Corinthians 3, 18. But we all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. We're changed by what we behold, what you look at. Now, this, this is a different thing. What are we looking at? It's what we're hearing through preaching, and it's also what we're reading, studying, listening to, as far as, far as that goes. And we're changed from glory to glory. We get in the presence of the Lord. We pray. We pray over the word. And that word enters our hearts. And we're changed into the same image from glory to glory. And that's from the inside out. Again, um, let me read one more scripture. We can talk about this. 1 Corinthians 2, 4. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. Again, Preaching is foolishness to the world. The teaching of the Word of God is foolishness to the world. But it's the power of God. There is power in the Word preached under the anointing of God. Now, let's look at the big picture. We are God designs not that we're changed in our mind merely, but God designs that we're changed from the inside out. So we're, our soul is at our core. That's the nature of our spirit. So our spirit then is where the attributes of the mind are. Reason, conscience, affection, imagination, memory. Those five things are senses are in the spirit then there's the body see taste feel smell and hear so psychology seeks to change you on the second level it's approaching merely the mind the word of god preached in power is approaching the soul and it then from the soul level changes the mind changes the body Psychology can never change a man's heart. It can change his mind, but it can't change his heart. Psychology can never produce the gospel. Psychology has never healed a man, delivered a woman, produced a miracle, or gave someone eternal life. Psychology has changed the way people think, but it has not 
transform their life. You say, well, uh, I have an experience. I went to a therapist and they talked to me. Sometimes just talking about what's being said can help. And you don't need a degree in psychology to help someone. You can just be a friend and listen, and that can help them. It's very simple. There is, so psychology, let's look at what the word is. Suke means soul, and ology means the study of. Now, there is a true study of the soul, but it isn't based upon the modern theories of education from Sigmund Freud, Carl Jung, William James, Ivan Pavlov, or Alfred Adler. The foundation of psychology, understand this, the foundation of psychology is not a biblical worldview. It's a godless educational foundation, evolutionary understanding. That's what it is. Science, civilization, and education are all of the devil. Brother Branham t tells us that and teaches that to us very clearly. Now, it's a godless, again, it's a godless educational foundation. What a danger. So Sigmund Freud was a founding father of psychology. And what did he produce in his life? He was a drug addict. He reduced everybody to the basic level of they're driven by sex. That's what he thought and that's what he taught. What nonsense. All right, now let's look at a few quotes from Brother Branham. The Angel of God, 1948. When sometimes when I catch can catch their eyes, that's how I get them in that channel, you see. And then it's not a mind reading. It's not psychology. If it is, then Paul used it when he looked upon the man and said, I perceive you have faith to be healed. I will grant you this. It is psychology in this way. Psyche, of course, means mind, and it's the mind of Christ. That the the human mind has the privilege to enter in and know the mind of Christ. Hallelujah. My, what a reality to dwell in the channel of Christ. We unworthy mortals have been brought in, in to be sons and daughters, to be fellow citizens. All right, so there we see Brother Branham saying there is a real uh, psyche or psychology, and that's having the mind of Christ. Amen. That's the, that's the true psychology. Modern psychology has departed from that and is uh, wading in wicked and evil waters. 1961, Micaiah the prophet says, We'll never be able to convert the world by trying to shine up our churches and make them bigger and polish up our ministers with better education. They already got all that stuff. They got all kinds of psychology and ball games and everything. The world has got that. But we got something they haven't got. That's Christ, see? Try, just stay in your own territory. We got Christ. They don't have Christ. They got all the psychology. Or don't try to match them with wits. They, you can't do it. They don't. They can outmatch you. So it's not about being ultra-intelligent. It's not about having the smartest, best educated, biggest polished churches that draw in the masses using psychology. Preach the word. Preach the word, preach the word, and let it change people's lives. Just once more, Lord, 1963. Now we got seminaries that hatch out ministers, and we're building bigger ones all the time, and we got students of psychology. And that's all right if you want to teach psychology, but I don't care about psychology. I want to know Jesus Christ. That's all. All I want to know is Him. Amen. Look. There's all kinds of knowledge that we can seek. There's all kinds of information that we can seek, and we can dive into whatever it is deeply. But again, this is talking about the matters of life and death. You're not going to be changed and transformed by psychology. Your, your mind can be helped. You can be reformed. Uh, a broken clock is right twice a day, right? So look. It, by by just changing the mind, you're not changing the man. You're just reforming him. And he could easily slip right back into old habits. But when you preach the word of God, it goes to the soul and it brings about a transformation. And it brings about a deliverance. 
You know, this is a spiritual warfare. It's not merely a flesh and blood thing. If you change his mind, it'll be changed. What about the demon powers? Are you going to change their mind? No, you have to have the power of God to overcome. It takes way more than that. All right, Jehovah Jireh, 1964. The Branham said, he said, Sir, Mohammedism can produce just as much psychology as Christianity can. And they do, do. You ought to hear them shout and scream. That's right. Produce just as much psychology as Christi Christianity can. He said, well, what do you mean when you said that Jesus promised all these things to you? He said, I suppose you're referring to Mark, Mark 16. He says, yes, that's one of them. Not altogether, but that's one. Jesus said the last words he said to the church, go ye into all the world, see and preach the gospel, and these signs shall follow the believer. How long? All the world, every creature. If they lay hands on their on the sick, they shall recover. The last words he said, according to your scripture. He said, well, you see, that's just, said, you see, that ain't, part ain't inspired. He said, he really didn't mean that. That wasn't. He said, it ain't inspired. He said, what kind of a book are you reading? He said, all the Quran is inspired. Hmm. It's a defeat of the weakness of theology, a man-made theology that hasn't got the spirit to stand up and face the thing. Like the Hebrew children said, our God is able to deliver us from the fiery furnace, but nevertheless will not bow to this image. We need people with courage. Men who has believed God has always been courageous and believed in the supernatural. Men who believe God. Mr. Reed had said, I kicked the floor, Brother Branham. Kicked the dust just like that, and I couldn't answer the man. He said, I purposed in my heart to come see you after that and ask what this was all about. And said, here I am. He said, if the Holy Ghost, said Brother Branham, my mother sent me to school and said, when I got my B.A., I thought, there is exactly. I said, I know what you mean. I said, then one day I got my B.A., thought right there I'd find Christ. He wasn't there in my doc when I got my doctor's degree. I said, I got enough degrees, honorary degrees, to plaster your walls. And where is Christ in all of it? I said, who am I to say that the teachers are wrong? But that's not the, what we're talking about. It's the person, Christ, that you must know. Now the man is holding great campaigns everywhere, and Dr. Lee Vale there, a good friend of mine, is a friend of his also, and he's having great success praying for the sick and holding great big campaigns and everything. It's because that man believed. There you go. It's not by convincing people using arguments. Paul did it. Paul preached and used arguments, but didn't it stop there? Right? You can read the book of Acts. He argued with, he disputed with, the people right and he used scriptural arguments to defend his point but when a push came to shove what was it the demonstration of the spirit came brother Barnum uses arguments defenses of the gospel of the word of god to make his point but it doesn't stop there it has to go into demonstration of the spirit and of power in the identified masterpiece of God. Brother Branham says, what we need today is the life of Christ inside of us. That's what purifies, not the outward, a turned around collar or a degree of psychology or something. It takes the power of the resurrected Christ to make us what we should be. God has no other plan than to let the Holy Spirit rule and reign in the church, not psychology ruling and reigning in the church, not an intellectual gospel, but the power of God to change people's lives. Satan's Eden, 1965. And in this intellectual, theological seminaries that's brought out an intellectual person that's been trained how to speak, what to do, how to make their emotions and everything like that, been trained how to speak, what to do, how to make their emotions, and everything like psychology, three and four years to know how to deal with a man's mind. See, it's the Spirit of God's not something that you it's schooled into you, it's something that's predestinated into you by the hand of Almighty God. Your experiences cannot be schooled or taught into you, predestinated by God's hand and God's foreknowledge into you. That's right. Amen. A, a gift is a gift. Everybody's gifting is a little different, and it goes in a different way. Now, I want to just take one minute to talk about what psychology is not. Teaching people how to have a godly marriage is not psychology. Now, you can use psychology to do that, but we ought to use the Word of God. And the Word of God changes, brings transformation, brings power to live according to the gospel. Teaching people 
the Bible is not psychology. It's the power of God. When a true anointed teacher teaches the gospel, it is the power of God to change lives because you're laying the word before people and letting the Holy Spirit take that and reveal it to them so that they can live according to the word of God. Brother Branham never puts teaching into psychology. Now, there is a teaching that is psychological. There is marriage counseling that can be psychology. But counseling is not psychology. Giving people instructions from the Bible is not psychology. Now, let's let's look at it and let's let's dig deeper into into modern psychology, the history of modern psychology. We can see more of the difference. So, psychology seeks to explain and categorize human behavior. As such, it's directly affected by the worldview that stands behind that theory. In modern pop psychology, everything is based upon this happened to you as a trauma response, and this thinking has been popularized all around the world. And that's because of TikTok and Facebook and Instagram, YouTube. In fact, psychologists themselves do not espouse to most of the social media influencers' versions of psychology that are floating around. They're floating around as fact, and young people are living by them and in bondage because they feel they have no hope outside of themselves because of this stupid pop psychology that goes around. Christians, don't be guilty of giving your mind to that garbage that comes off of social media. What is of particular note is the prevailing theory going around among many generations of people, Gen X, Millennials, Gen Z, that is that our behavior came as a result of trauma responses from childhood. We speak in terms of being triggered by certain things we encounter, and this creates a behavior chain resulting from past experiences. Certainly that's true on, on some level, but we... Modern people put it all across the board. What a danger. Puts people in bondage. But the problem with that version of psychology is that it leads to a permanent victim mentality. That is where we're at today in modern psychology. They're living in a Marxist victim mentality. And you're fighting. There is continually fighting against the system because they believe they're continually victims of the system. God never allows us to blame our behavior and our responses on others. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It's given unto man once to die, and after that the judgment. We will be judged for the deeds we have done in the body. While trauma response can sometimes be helpful in understanding root causes of some behaviors, I mean, if you look at Brother Branham, he will go through discernment, and sometimes he explains, this happened to you when you were a child, and therefore this sickness or this thing has come upon you. But he didn't leave the people there in that and say, uh, if you can just uh, try to do this, then this will respond. No. He pointed them to the deliverance and the supernatural power of Jesus Christ to set them free. You're not a victim. This may have happened, but you're not a victim. You're, you are responsible for your own reaction to whatever stimuli came your way. Again, trauma response can be helpful. But it doesn't explain everything, and in some ways it actually is not really of any use to bring healing. Ultimately, psychology encourages two things, psychotherapy and medication. This is, their, this is the core. They diagnose a problem and recommend various means of healing, and that it would be medication or psychotherapy. What is psychotherapy? Psychotherapy. Uh, again, these these are from. Uh, this is from a, a website. Uh, 
in the research that I've done looking at psychology, psychotherapy, also called talk therapy, refers to a variety of treatments that aim to help a person identify and change troubling emotions, thoughts, and behaviors. Most psychotherapy takes place one-on-one -on -one with a licensed mental health professional or with other patients in a group setting. Psychotherapy and medication are the most common forms of mental health treatment. NIMH has information on medical health conditions. In general, the goals of psychotherapy are to gain relief from symptoms, maintain, again, I'm reading, this is not my viewpoint, I'm reading to you what, what, they're, what, what they're telling you about psychology. In general, the goals of psychotherapy are to gain relief from symptoms, maintain or enhance daily functioning, and improve quality of life. You or someone you know might seek out psychotherapy for many reasons, including dealing with severe or long-term stress from a job or family situation, the loss, of a the loss of a loved one or relationship or fa of family problems, having symptoms with no physical explanation such as changes in sleep or appetite, low energy, lack of interest or, or pleasure in activities you once enjoyed, persistent irritability, excessive worry, or a sense of discouragement or hopelessness that won't go away. A healthcare provider sus suspecting you have or diagnosing you with a mental disorder that is in interfering your, with your life, or supporting a child or family member who has been diagnosed with a condition affecting their mental health. First being examined by a healthcare provider can help rule out a physical issue. This step is important because sometimes symptoms, like a change in mood or trouble concentrated, are due to a medical condition. Psychotherapy and other treatment options. Continuing to read. Psychotherapy can be used as an alternative to or alongside medication and other treatment options. Choosing the right treatment plan is based on a person's individual needs and medical situation and should occur under the guidance of a mental health professional. Even when medication relieves symptoms, psychotherapy can help address specific issues. These might include self-defeating ways of thinking, irrational fears, problems interacting with other people, or difficulty coping with situations at home, school, or work. What are the elements of psychotherapy? A variety of psychotherapies have been shown to effectively treat mental health disorders. Often the type of treatment is tailored to the specific disorder. For example, the treatment approach for someone who has obsessive compulsive disorder is different than the approach for someone who has bipolar disorder. Therapists may use one primary approach or incorporate elements from multiple approaches depending on their training the disorder being treated, and the needs of the person receiving treatment. Elements of psychotherapy can include the following. Help a person become aware of automatic ways of thinking that are inaccurate or harmful. For example, having a low opinion of their abilities, and then question these thoughts, those thoughts. Understand how the thoughts affect their emotions and behavior, and change self-defeating behavior patterns. This approach is known as cognitive behavioral therapy. Identify ways to cope with stress and develop problem-solving strategies. Examine interactions with others and teach social and communication skills. Apply mindfulness and relaxation techniques such as medication, meditation and breathing exercises. Use exposure therapy, a type of CBT for anxiety disorders, in which a person spends brief periods in a supportive environment learning to tolerate the distress caused by certain items, ideas, or imagined scenes. This is continued until, over time, the fear associated with those things goes down. Track emotions and behaviors to raise awareness of their impact on each other. Use supportive counseling to explore troubling issues and receive emotional support. Create a safety plan to help with thoughts of self-harm or suicide. Recognize warning signs and use coping strategies, such as contacting friends, family, or emergency personnel. There are many types of psychotherapy. Therapies are often variations of an established approach, such as CBT. There is no formal approval process for psychotherapies like there is for medications by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. However, for many therapies, research involving large numbers of patients has provided evidence that the treatment is effective. These evidence-based therapies have been shown to reduce symptoms of depression, anxiety, and other mental disorders. NIMH's health topic pages list some of the evidence-based therapies used to treat specific disorders. All right, so that's that's speaking about psychology. And as you look at it and examine it, a uh, few things that I, th I think of. This is 
seeking to take the place of God and the things that God has put in his word. If you look and understand what psychology is, it is seeking to take the place of the word of God and the principles God has placed in his word. If you can understand clearly and with a level head here, you can see that, a, that man has erased God from the picture and sought to replace what God provides with man-made knowledge that leads to further bondage to something else. Self-improvement is fine, but self-improvement is not what God called us to. It, it, he calls us to something totally different. You say, we're not to, supposed to improve ourselves? Absolutely, we should improve ourselves. But there's God's way of doing it, and there's man's way of doing it. And God's way leads you closer to Him and brings true eternal happiness. Man's way of doing things leads to greater dependence on man. Going to therapy and talking to an educated person that helps you understand the causes of your behavior based upon a theory that does not account for what God speak to us, speaks to us is actually destructive, dangerous, and foolish. We simply follow God's basic principles, both in the spiritual and the natural. We would not really need a psychologist. Now, let's, let's look at the big picture. We're told to fellowship in church. And even more so, as you see the day approaching, we're called to worship with a group of believers and listen to the proclamation of the word of God. We're told to bring our problems to God and he will move in them. If we're struggling with anything, we can go to the elders of church and be prayed for and counseled by the word of God going forward in a prayer line. We can go forward to the altar and pray. We can go to church early and get on our knees and get our faces before God and pray. And the power of God will flow through the lives of believers and deals with their issues, problems, sickness, and mental complexes. Fellowship with like-minded believers. Go to coffee, have a friend, and talk about what you're going through. These are things that the Word of God speaks about. Psychology seeks to solve our complexes aside and apart from the Word of God. And so it's a merely a natural thing, and in many cases is ultimately a deceptive thing. Why? Because it's Oh, you say it can help because I went through this and talked talk through this. We're putting things in place of God that if we did it the right way, God would help us. Talk to your pastor. If you're struggling with something, talk to your pastor. If you can't find anybody else to talk to, schedule a time and say, I need to talk to you alone and, and, and bear my heart to you about something because I'm struggling. That's what God calls us to do. And the pastor is going to point you to the word and he's going to listen. The word of God carries with it supernatural power, not merely to reform the way we think, but to transform our minds supernaturally and to heal our body, soul, and spirit completely. God can take and don't totally change the situation 100%, not just the soul, but the body itself. Now, the other part we want to look at the danger is the danger of psychotropic drugs and how they seek to replace what God has designed for us. All right, now, here's some dangers of psychotropic drugs from Dr. Axe, Dr. Axe's website. I have 12 different ones. Side effects and withdrawal symptoms. Increased risk of suicide. Heart problems. Pregnancy and birth complications, violent behavior, worsened mental illness, car accidents, pure, poor immune function, drug abuse and addiction, sexual dysfunction, elevated risk of breast cancer, diabetes. Again, they speak about this, but as a, as a whole and as a, in general, the risk of suicide increases when you're on psychotropic drugs. Now, some of the most basic things actually can assist us in dealing with mental illnesses that we have or sicknesses or complexes or whatever it is. They're all things that God created and designed for us. Okay, now, again, you're going to say, my situation is different, and my situation is because of this and this, because of this. I'm looking at overarching principles. 
hear me out on the overarching principles before you start attacking. Now, I don't, I don't say that there are some medications that might help for a very short period of time, but overall, I think they're seeking to take the place of something that is missing that God can provide. And I'm not trying to attack anybody. I'm not trying to say this person shouldn't do this. This person shouldn't do that. I'm trying to proclaim an overall picture. If we applied the overall picture, I believe God would bring healing for you. I've tried. I've asked God and he hasn't healed. So I go to a psychologist. Oh my. Oh my. I don't know what to say to you. Hear me out. Hear me out. Here's some basic things that God has provided provided and created and put forward. And you're going to think they're so natural, but I'm just going to say they're simple things, seven different things. Exercise. Walk. Lift heavy things. Lift weights. We used to normally lift heavy things. Carry water into the home. Car carry buckets of sod. Carry buckets of water out to the field, whatever it might be. We don't do that anymore. So I recommend do, do lift heavy things, bench press, um, uh, do deadlifts, squat, do these kinds of things to prove your strength. If you're, if you're older and can't do it, simply just do air squats, um, lift up water bottles, bend over to the ground and stand up and lift water bottles. If you can only do it once, do it once one day and then Rest a couple days and do it twice the next day and then keep building on it. But walk, lift heavy things, exercise. We have to do this. Two, get outside and get sunshine in the morning and the evening. There's a lot of, there's a lot of studies that go into this, but getting sunshine is critically important. If you just sit in your house and you don't exercise, you're going to get depressed. Stay hydrated. Drink water. It helps so many different processes in your body. Four, eat a healthy, balanced diet. Eliminate seed oils and increase animal fats. Eat fruits, eat vegetables, um, eat natural foods. Five, communicate with your friends, your spouse, and your pastor. If you don't communicate and you hold everything on the inside, that builds up and that create that you, you blow up. Just talk to people. God wants you to share your life with your, your spouse, with your friends, with your pastor. Use that as a resource, as a tool. Six, spend time with friends, fellowship, fellowship. Talk about the word, talk about life, talk about God's creation. Seven, make sure you're getting enough vitamin D and take omega-3s. These are seven critical things. If you do that, along with you go to church, you pray, you seek God, these are simple things you can do to bring healing to yourself, just in a natural way. These are things that God has provided, God has supplied. Now let's look at how the Word of God speaks about healing our minds and traumas. First, we have to look at accountability and blame. Psychology seeks to find blame for your behavior and put it at the feet of others in order to bring healing. Um, it doesn't always do that, and that's, that's, that's true. Many times it lays the blame on you and the, your wrong way of thinking. All right, look at, let's look at what the Bible says. Revelation 20, 11 and 12. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. All right. Everyone is going to be judged according to their works. God's not going to stand and say, be the chief psychologist and say, you know, you did this because your dad, grand dad and your grandfather did this. No, you did that. You chose to do that. Well, I couldn't help it. You could. 
because God has a remedy and you refuse to take it. Verse 13, and the sea gave up the dead which were in it and the death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them and they were judged every man according to their works. According to their works. You're going to be judged according to your works. But I was coerced. My family, my... Th no, stop. Stop with the modern pop psychology. You will be judged for your works. Matthew 12, 36 through 38. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Then certain of the scribes and the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. So they want to see a sign, but Jesus shows them, you are going to be judged by your works. By even your very words. By even your very thoughts, Brother Branham says. Romans 14, verse 12. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. 1 Peter 4, verse 5. Who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead? Ezekiel 18, 1 through 4. The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, What mean ye that ye use this proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying, The fathers have eaten the sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, saith the Lord God, ye shall not have occasion any more to use this proverb in Israel. Behold, all souls are mine, as the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. We're all held account to account for our own actions, reactions, responses, attitudes, and thoughts, and everything that we do. will not be asked by God, who made you do that? Or was that the result of what your father or grandfather did? Now, again, a behavior, a behavior could be explained based upon some outward response due to something that happened in the past. But the fact remains, God will hold us personally accountable if we are disobedient to his word, regardless of the cause of it. So to hold someone else accountable makes you merely a victim of circumstances and holds you captive to a behavior that limits you and your status. God never seeks to limit us based on what happened to us. Instead, he always provides a way of escape and deliverance. 1 Corinthians 10, verses 12 and 13. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape, that you may be able to bear it. Now, this isn't speaking of all mankind. This is speaking of Christians who are filled with the Holy Ghost. He doesn't make a way for everybody to escape temptation, but he makes a way for Christians. He provides a means for us to be delivered from the temptation. And look at this, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 8 through 11. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a death, and doth deliver, in whom we have trust that he will yet deliver us, you also helping together by prayer for us, that for the gift bestowed upon us by the means of many persons, thanks may be given by many on our, our, our behalf. We might be in horrible situations. We might be pressed beyond measure to where we despair even of life, but we have this sentence of death in ourselves, not so that we wouldn't trust in ourselves, but trust in God. And God will pro provide that means of deliverance. He'll provide a remedy for pain, trauma, sorrow, and ways of thinking that are contrary to his word. And we're supposed to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Now, let's look at how God does this. Isaiah 61, 1 through 3. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of the vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, 
to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. He didn't bring, he didn't come to bring psychology to us, to change us from mourning and heaviness to joy and praise. What did he do? He brought the Holy Ghost to us through his blood to bring a transformation. Well, sometimes Christians get depressed and get the spirit of heaviness. By his spirit, by his power, he will set you free from mourning and heaviness. But sometimes it's the very basic things of applying the word of God in obedience that we actually get deliverance. If you simply apply the word, you're set free. But if you refuse to apply the, apply the word and you go after psychology, you're going to be stuck there because you're halfway, on a, you're on a, some kind of fence seeking to find deliverance man's way and God's way. You can't find it in sitting on the fence. You have to go God's way. Isaiah 53, 3 through 6, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Our griefs and our sorrows are laid on, are, bo are born by him. He carries them. Cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. That's through prayer that we cast our cares on him. But really the Bible is telling us right there, he, when he went to Calvary, when he went to the cross and shed his blood for us, our griefs and sorrows were put on him so that we could be delivered from them. How dare we go to the human means to receive something that God has ordained for us to receive supernaturally? All right. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, 9 through 12. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. For you were made sorry after a godly manner, that you might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. For behold, this self same thing, that you sorrowed after a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you, yea, what clearing of yourselves, yea, what indignation, yea, what fear, yea, what vehement desire, yea, what zeal, yea, what revenge. In all, these, in all things you have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. Wherefore, though I wrote unto you, I did not for this cause that I had done the wrong, nor for this cause that suffered the wrong, but that our care for you in the sight of God might appear unto you. So it's not through, look at that, sorrow leads to repentance. We think sorrow, oh, something's wrong, we have to get psychotherapy. Maybe I need some kind of drugs. Maybe the sorrow is leading you to repentance. It's not through psychotherapy and psychotropic drugs that we receive deliverance. That's not in the scripture. Those are poor replacements for the power of the gospel and the deliverance that comes to us through the supernatural spirit of God moving in our midst. If we follow God's word and use what he has provided us with in this world, we won't need a poor replacement based upon atheism and evolution to heal and help our problems. Though on the short term, some drugs may help. In the long run, healing must come from God. In those places, we have thinking that is contrary to his word needs to be transformed. So we think with the mind of Christ. It's, it isn't a mere mental work that will change us. It's the supernatural power of God that will truly bring transformation at the soul level. Psychology is about self-actualization, affirming self, denying shame, and making one feel better in their sin. All is antithetical to God's word. Unfortunately, feminism, modern psychology so permeate our culture that preaching is practically universally corrupted by them. Modern thought is saturated with modern psychology. 
It put, puts man at the center and seeks to please man instead of seeking to please and glorify God and redeem man by God's power. And joy comes through full surrender to Almighty God and changing your desires from the things of the world to the things of God. When your desire has changed and your joy is in God, then whatever comes your way, you can turn to him and worship, seek his face, and follow him. Now, I want to comment more. When we, when we live contrary to God's way and God's word, we automatically enter into this place that we, in fact, are subject to depression, sorrow, sadness. Sitting, and I'm guilty of it, sitting on our phone, scrolling, 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 continuously, is not living the way God designed us to live. God designed us to be outside, to be in the sun, to work hard, to move our bodies, to spend time in prayer, to spend time in thought without being occupied by something, um, to, to spend time moving in the sunshine, to drink water, to lift heavy things, to talk to people direct face to face, to connect with our spouse, to touch and to hold, to worship in a community of people that love God and love each other. See, these are the things that lead to health and healing deliverance. The deliverance. He's designed us to be have our hearts filled. And there's an empty spot in our heart until the Holy Ghost comes in. Get filled with the Holy Ghost and follow God's order and God's plan and deliverance will come. Health and happiness will come. Do it, do it man's way and it produces death. God's way is life. Don't put man at the center. Put God at the center and glorify him with all your hearts. Well, thanks for listening. God bless you.